Hi, here in lesson 10, I'm going to continue on some of the same topics that we dealt with in lesson 9. First, I'm going to say a few words about Kuhn and, and how his thinking says something about science policy, how should we govern, organize, and fund science. I'll get to that in just a second. Then afterwards, here in this video, I'm going to do a short example of a scientific crisis of, of researchers who fundamentally disagreed on things. I'm going to use Kuhn's framework and terminology to try to address that. So first, just really brief summary, summary of Kuhn. Um, he's arguing that science is not just one long th accumulation of theories we built on yesterday. Sometimes we have to start over or sort of put in different. In other words, we can't just add, sometimes we can't just add chapters to textbooks we have to start over and say, let's rewrite the first chapter of our textbook because we fundamentally changed our perspective on something. But, and that's, I think, important to emphasize, Kuhn has also said himself that most of the time, he concedes, research is sort of normal and incremental and, and, and like this accumulative process. It's clear standards, agreed upon language, agreed upon techniques, agreed upon as, in, uh, um, assumptions. So. Just to make that clear, I mean, most of the time, science is normal, accumulative. Um, it's it's the sort of the rare revolutions that he's then talking about, the paradigm shifts where business as usual doesn't work and you suddenly have to fundamentally change your perspective, whether it's because you realize that hand washing actually prevents disease or you realize raising the minimum wage does not necessarily lead to more unemployment or, or sort of whatever the crisis could be. Um, so that's just to sort of make that very clear. And, and Kuhn's then overall point was that there is no theory independent way to, to get to what's what's really out there, what, what is there in the world. Because whenever we try to make sense of the world, we are relying on our education, our experience, our way of seeing the world. And, and it's always already theoretical. We can't step out and sort of take out our take off our theoretical or paradigmatic glasses. So it doesn't make sense to think of how a theory could sort of ontologically speaking correspond to a real counterpart in nature because there's just no way of making that comparison. Whenever we try to compare our concept to the world, whether it's motivation or something about the stock market or strategy or physics or whatever it is, we are already using theoretical language in the way we measure things. We can't sort of get around that. That's a fundamental point by Kuhn. And that's why he's saying in the end, a new paradigm is going to be winning by sort of the survival of the fittest, this evolutionary perspective, by being better at solving puzzles, um, being better at predicting. It's not because it's rationally speaking more true or depicts the world more clearly. And that is then sort of Kuhn's take on science, and I think that's important to get a sense of what science is, but it also has, I think, more sort of more political and practical implications. So if we say science is a completely rational process where theory can correspond to the world. Well, then there is a clear standard for what the best science is and what science to fund. So maybe it's difficult to find out. Maybe there can still be disagreement, but there would be sort of a way of, of, of realizing whether one theory was better than another or one paradigm was better than another because you could compare it to the world and the world could be the final standard and there is an objective truth that we can talk about. That would be the case if we were engaging in this rational accumulation. So, and this is then the point here I want to make, then it also becomes much easier to find out what science to fund because, uh, so what governments around the world and what companies should focus on because it is actually possible to, to find the right answer. Uh, it might be difficult, it might be very difficult, but it's possible. But if Kuhn is right, then, well, how do we then decide what is the better scientific approach? And how do we decide what to fund? I mean, what does it mean that you are better at solving puzzles, for instance? I mean, what puzzles are we interested in solving? Um, so, so Kuhn is then saying that even within the paradigm, it can be very difficult to agree on what the best science is and what to fund, because everyone sees the world slightly differently. They have slightly different educations, experiences, and angles and, and, and data there that are looking at. But it's certainly also then true across paradigms that there's no clear standard. So it becomes very difficult. And, and again, who in Denmark should decide what science to fund and, and what researchers to promote? Um, Kuhn is then, after all, still saying, well, 
it might be difficult to sort of agree upon and, and, and figure out, but there are some theories that are simply better at solving puzzles than others. Um, and, and if we find out that this way of educating entrepreneurs actually lead to more successful entrepreneurs, well, that is then the more correct theory. That's the better theory. That's, that's Kuhn's point. But he's, he provided this terminology and framework for what is truth, what, what can science do, why do we see all these disagreements, and how do they get solved? So it's a very, that sounds very fundamental and has really shaped uh, thinking about science in the last 50, 60 years, um, which is also why it was this highly cited work. Okay, I just want to make that sort of also link to science policy in order to also highlight and, and, and show and this is actually important not just because it tells us something about what science is and we're interested in that in the philosophy of science course but it actually also has implications for thinking about who gets to decide these things is it politicians is it the the, the, the most prestigious researchers is it a consensus is it democracy is it the citizens it's actually not entirely clear um going by this Kuhnian framework okay so the other thing i want to do here in in this in this first video today is to try to use an example to, and, and use Kuhn's framework and terminology to try to sort of show how disagreements in science can happen and why they're not easy to resolve. So it's based on this article, it's not a curriculum, but I'm just using this as an example. So it's an article about, it's called Sad Face, as you can see, it's about whether we can smile our way to happiness. I'm gonna get to in just a second what, what that means. So, it, this area basically deals with sort of a very fundamental question. What is an emotion? And, and just sort of very briefly put, back in the 19th century, there was actually an argument or a line of thinking that says emotions don't really exist unless they manifest. So someone is not mad until he or she tells the world that he or she is mad or um, you can sort of tell on the face or whatever. I mean, it has to be manifested. You couldn't just have emotions that, that weren't to be seen. And then later on in the 20th century, they went to different explanations. Maybe emotions are just contracted after the fact, after something has happened. Uh, or maybe we can even shape our emotions by sort of forcing ourselves to be happy or forcing a smile. And this is then what led to the research that I want to talk about here. So, question is, can we change people's opinions, oh, oh, sorry, emotions, can we change people's emotions by changing the way that their face looks like. So can we sort of force people into a smile and then see if that changes their, their happiness? Of course, we can't just tell people, please smile, because that might make people aware of that they're in, in a study where they have to think about smiling and, and maybe that makes them more happy. We want to sort of really get to, can we just by shaping the physiological features of a face, make them happy? And the way they did this was that you had these 92 students who participated in an experiment and, 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 and at some point in the, the setup, they had to either put a pen in the mouth like this here, and you sort of have a frowning face almost. I mean, you, don't, so you don't, certainly don't have a smiling face when you do that. Your, the physiological sort of makeup of your face does not look like a smile. And while if you put it between your teeth, you actually end up doing something that resembles a smile. It might not really look authentic, but your facial features, features have to in use the muscles in a way as if it was smiling. So this is what, what um, researchers made these undergraduate students uh, do. First, they made them do some other tasks to sort of distract them. And then while they had this pen in the mouth or uh, in different ways, they had to assess how funny a cartoon was. And this was actually the cartoon that was used back then. You can look at it yourself, pause the video if you want and consider if you find it funny. I mean, Put a pen in your mouth if you want to. And uh, as you can see, um, when the students were frowning with their pens balanced on their, on their, on their lips, so actually the, this image is not entirely how the way it was done uh, originally, the, they rated the cartoons at 4.3 on average, but when they were smiling and like this here, they were rated at 5.1 on average. So it seems to be the case that um, you could make people happier by simply sort of moving their physiological features of their face around. But later research has then sort of turned out there were, seems to be some problems with this force of smile research. So 
Originally, it was actually seemed to be the case that you could replicate this many times, and many different kinds of research have tried something similar. You can sort of influence your emotions in this way. However, in 2015, there was a study that uh, tried to replicate this originally pen in your mouth or pen between your teeth uh, smiling study. So 17 labs around eight countries and including 2,000 subjects, so far, far bigger sample than the 92 we saw in the original study, tried to replicate this, so meaning they tried to do the exact same setup, same cartoon, same everything. Eight labs could not replicate it, nine could. On average, it was three hundredths of a rating point of a difference. So imagine that it's a... Um, so one could call this sort of a random blip, a distant echo in the noise. So let's say the scale was from one to seven, and then you suddenly have three hundredths of a rating point of a difference across 2,000 subjects. That's maybe not, maybe it's statistically significant, but it, it's basically nothing. So smiling research, not so happy, right? It doesn't seem to work after all. And as Kuhn says, as argument piled on argument, well, is it only blind stubbornness that can make people still believe in this smiling research? Well, if we ask Shrek, who's still engaged in this kind of research, he's saying, well, it's impossible to make a perfect copy of an old experiment. People change, time change, cultures change. I mean, they used a cartoon that was funny in the 80s or 70s, and maybe that's not really funny anymore. So giving these non-replications, I'm not changing my mind. I have no reason to change my mind. Okay, no reason. How could he turn his back on all that evidence? So, so Strack, one of the researchers here, he's certainly not changing his mind. He's actually thinking that this project replication, when you're trying to see if there are flaws in all the research, well, that's like the McCarthy era in, in, in the States in the 19, what was it, 50s, 60s. It's quite a harsh comparison to make in people that just want to sort of run research again. It actually turns out that a very recent study has, has shown that Maybe it depends on what we could call the Hawthorne effect. So they tried two different conditions. One where there was a video camera uh, and one where there wasn't. Um, and, and, and it actually seems to be matter whether you were felt monitored or not. So I'm not, you can sort of pause the video and read this abstract if you're interested. But sort of the main point here is that this is sort of an answer to this replication attempt of these, in these 17 laboratories around the world. And the argument here is that well, it depends on how you set it up and how you do it. And, and this is a Facebook post that Fred Strack wrote in a group a couple, was it a year ago, I think? And, and, um, and he's still very clearly saying, no, facial feedback hypothesis of his, about the smiling study still absolutely works. So he's not changing his mind. He certainly doesn't think that argument after argument has piled on. So. One could then ask oneself, well, where in Kuhn's model are we? What phase is this? Is this a proper model crisis where we have to change the paradigm, or is this just a sort of a normal science crisis where people disagree? Um, and, and I mean, it, there, there's certainly some disagreement on what an emotion is, and can we actually influence emotions just by sort of physiologically forcing the features of a face to to change. And there's also disagreement on the values that I play. Should an experiment be able to replicate across time? I mean, does it is it meaningful to have a theory that could only explain something with a particular cartoon in a particular country, in a particular culture, in a particular time in, point in time? When can we actually say a study is deemed to have failed? There is some fundamental disagreement on, on how we assess the quality of science. Um, I think overall one can say this is still a reasonably normal science crisis. I mean, there are certainly strong disagreements. Um, if we end up having to give up on the opportunity or ability to, to influence people's emotions in any way, if there are not only the smiling study, but all sorts of other things people have also tried, if that just doesn't turn out to work, and maybe if we end up showing that these artificial lab experiments are just not meaningful when we do these psychological studies, well, that would be sort of a more fundamental revolution. Um, so... So I think that's sort of the, the, the way we can use this example, that, that for now, it, there was some fundamental disagreement going on, for sure, but, but, but they're still speaking the same language, they're still using the same methods, they're still looking at sort of each other's data set and, and analyzing it, they're just disagreeing on exactly what to infer from them. Maybe future studies will sort of be able to... Um, be able to offer new perspectives, new data that, that, that 
that, that, that uh, can convince all parties. Who knows? 